Well, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This year, we are focused on the Holy Spirit, his person, his power, his presence and his provision. Let's talk for a moment about his power, because the Holy Spirit is seen powerfully moving in the book of Genesis. But throughout the prophets, we start seeing the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, during the judges, you see his power upon men like Gideon, on men like Samson, on a woman like Deborah. And you'll find that when the Holy Spirit comes to empower people, that they're able to do things that are supernatural. What the Holy Spirit does is he takes his super, puts it on our natural, and we're able to do incredible and amazing things things. We want you to join us during this season so that you can feel and experience and then also show forth the power of the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. Well, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And uh, we have just come to the house of the Lord to give thanksgiving, praise and worship unto him. Amen. 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 Psalm 92 and verse number 12 uh, simply says that the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in their old age and they shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. We give thanks to the Lord that we're in the house of the Lord today. And I'm expecting us to flourish in this place. And the flourish just simply means that you're gonna break forth with new life. And during this time, we get a chance to experience that because we're between that winter time and spring time. And right now, you're starting to see even a few little green leaves come out. And, you, and that lets you know that there's still life there. And so we're going to expect life to come in the sanctuary today, the Holy Spirit to move in the midst of us. Uh, this is our first Sunday uh, of worship so of the month. And so we're going to also be sharing in the communion table. And so there should be some... Uh, elements on your seat right there and as we worship the lord this morning we'll move into the communion table share it as at the lord's table together amen in jesus name with that being said i'm going to pray and then our team's going to come lead us in a worship and praise together and we're just going to lift up a joyful noise unto the lord for those who are joining us in our virtual service we'd like to welcome you here and we want you in your space not just to watch worship but to be worshipers and to join in in spirit and in truth. And we're just thanking the Lord for that. With that being said, let's pray. We're going to begin our time together in worship. Amen. In Jesus' name. Father, we just give you thanksgiving for all that you have done and all that you are going to do as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that you'll just do great and mighty things in the midst of us because you are the mighty God. I pray that you'll meet us in a powerful way. Meet us with signs and wonders and miracles today, Father. And we thank you today, Father, for all that you're going to do. Would you save anyone that's lost, reclaim anyone that's backslidden, add to the church, uh, those who would be saved. Uh, Father, we lift up all of the families, uh, Father, that have uh, experienced loss. We lift up the family of uh, Pastor Eddie Poindexter uh, today, Father. We lift up the family of Louise Haig today, Father. Uh, we lift up the Cecily family today, Father, in Jesus' name. And Father, all these various families uh, that have had association and membership with our church and their extended family, Father, the Burton family, Father, as well as the Mitchell family in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that not only you are a comfort to those that have lost, but you're also a strength and a comfort to us uh, in this sanctuary. So you be glorified in everything that we do. And we give you the thanksgiving, the glory, and the honor for it now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, be exalted in the sanctuary, and we praise you for it. And why don't you go ahead and clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph, and let's go ahead and give praise unto the Lord. It's time to praise him.
come. We have come to praise the mighty name of Jesus. So our God is for us. Who can stand against us? So we lift our voices, singing hallelujah. For he has redeemed us by his awesome power. Awesome is our God. the Lord. 
worship you I live to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you to worship you I live to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you father may our life be a life poured out that we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable worship. Father, that we would not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, a light poured forth 
in service and in worship and in righteousness and in justice. Father, it's a life that you require. Father, we thank you that you've chosen us to be laborers together with you in the earth. It's not all up to you. It's not all up to us. But we are laborers together with Christ in the earth. Father, I stand in awe of that covenant and of that agreement. That you would know all about us and still desire to use us. Oh, God, thank you. So, Father, we cast off all guilt, all condemnation. Cast off the past. And forget everything that's behind and reach forward to those things that are before. And press towards a mark in the prize. Father, now we thank you that you've given us a covenant. And when you can swear by no other, you swore by yourself. And you confirm the covenant, Father, by the immutability of your counsel and in the fact that you do not lie. Father, thank you that you are called faithful and true. You are faithful in that you do not change. And Father, you are true in that you do not lie. So we thank you that you have made a covenant available to us. It's been ratified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. On your seats, there are communion elements. Could you... Take those elements now. We're going to enter into the table of the Lord. It was during the time of Passover, the season that we now approach, that Jesus had his disciples go and prepare a room, an upper room, for them to observe this feast. This was a feast of liberation where they brought, brought out of slavery and they were brought into the land that God had promised them. This feast had been celebrated for years and years and years. But this time when Jesus came to the table with his disciples, he established a brand new covenant. Established upon better promises. And through this new covenant, we have a right to eternal life. It's not the old things of our own works. Because our own works are like filthy rags because it's in our own human effort. And I don't know about you, but I know my human efforts fail sometimes. So Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He came and he redeemed us and he saved us. And in the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread in the face of betrayal. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. He said, take and eat. Father, we examine ourselves, and as we eat of this bread, we say, this is your body. And we become partakers of your divine nature. Let's eat of the bread in remembrance of him. Mmm. And after the same manner, he also took the cup. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Drink ye all of it. And as often as you do it, you do declare the death of the Lord till he comes again. Father, we look forward to his coming again. Where death will be swallowed up in victory. No more shame. No more pain. No more goodbyes. No more war. No more killing. No more murder a new heaven and a new earth, a new name, a new Jerusalem today. We thank you that we look forward to that new day, oh Lord. We do this in remembrance of you till you come again. Let's drink of the cup. Mmm. The psalmist wrote that when he brought him out of Egypt, he brought him out with the silver and gold. Anyone that's experiencing financial challenge because of our covenant with him right now, I rebuke poverty and the curse on your resource and on your money. 
on your income, on your increase, even with inflation and high gas prices, God stretch people's resource. Father, when we're dealing with the fishes and the loaves in the face of all of this economic turmoil, increase. For I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. Hallelujah. At the end of the month, Father, let there be more money left and more resource left because we don't need a new president or a new program or a new senator or a congressman. We just need God. Yes, yes Lord. Yes. And we thank you that you reign. And we thank you that you reign. He brought them out the silver and the gold, and I hear this other thing in the Lord, and there was not one feeble one among them. So I come against every bit of bodily weakness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command those things to go in Jesus' name. Any inflammation, any abnormal growth, any abnormal discharges, any prognosis or diagnosis that's against your health, in the name of Jesus, go! Release! You are holy. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. So, Father, as we release that, those two words of knowledge, I thank you today, Father, that we can agree with John that I desire that you be in health and prosper, even as your soul prospers. In Jesus' name. Let's sing it to the Lord. Let's tell him how holy he is. Come on, church. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. The elders and angels bow, the redeemed worship you now. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Say it again, holy, holy, holy. Line. The elders and angels bow. The, the elders, elders and angels bow. The redeemed worship you now. Holy, holy, holy are you. Say that one more time, team. The elders. The elders and angels bow. The redeemed worship you now. Everyone in the sanctuary, lift up your hands. And just say this, Lord, you're holy. You are pure. You're the only living God. Say this after me, there's no darkness in you. You change not. I love you, Lord. Go ahead and give the Lord a big kiss and a big embrace in Jesus' name. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, 
Lord. Who would not serve a God like this? I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. One last time right here. Holy. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us in our worship. Thank you, Father, for meeting us in our communion table as we commune with you and with one another. In Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. 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 Why don't you be seated for just a moment? Amen. Thank you, team. Yolanda? Amen. Listen, we'll be right down here. Yolanda, right here. There you go. I know you're all excited. <laughs> I'm nervous. Okay. Hi, my name is Yolanda Twitty, and I'm a recovering addict. I live with Mama Ursler. Um, I wanted to share what Pastor was talking about a couple Sundays ago about getting a better job. I work for Clean Term Commercial Cleaning, and we work as a team. Um, as of Monday, I'm a porter now, and I got my own building. I work at Franklin International Clean in that building. Watch out. <laughs> Go ahead. And, um, and I also wanted to say, I used to be at NetCare. Now, on Saturdays, I work for NetCare. Okay. Go ahead. You keep on moving forward, Yolanda. Amen. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? Hallelujah! We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And, and when those words of knowledge go forth in this service, I'm not one to go through a lot of gyrations and drama when I give a word of knowledge. I just give it. But if you'll hear it and receive it like she did, and like went forth this morning. Watch what God's hand will do in your life. Amen in Jesus' name. Thank you, thank you. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. It is the first weekend of the month, and on the first weekend of the month, we have readings from the word of God. So the ushers are going to line up our readers. We'll have a reader come, and we'll read from Isaiah uh, chapter 43. And then we'll have a reading from Psalm 126. We'll have a reading from uh, Philippians chapter 3. And then we'll have a reading from Psalm, oh, I'm sorry, John chapter 12. Uh, the final reading will be from Jeremiah 22. And that will be our sermonic text, the core text that I'll be preaching from over the next uh, few weeks. So as we come, why don't you come and... Uh, just read the word of God, all right? And let me lower this mic for some of our uh, people that are coming, okay? Is that good for you, Brother Wagner? Okay. Isaiah, wait. My name is Darnell Wagner, and today I will be reading Isaiah 43, verses 16 through 21, New Living Translation. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty, the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the wave, and they drowned. Their life snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I am about to do something new. See, I already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the field will thank me. The jackals, the owls, too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people could be refreshed. I have made Israel for myself, and they will someday honor me before the whole world. 
The word of the Lord. Good morning, Rama. Good morning. My name is Raiwa Buire, and today I'll be reading Psalm 126, the New Living Translation. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter, and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. The word of the Lord. Good morning, Rama. Good morning. I'm Ursula Crable, house mother. <laughs> I'm reading Philippians 3, 4 through 14 from the New Living Translation. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason of, for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight, year, eight days old. I am pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew. If there were ever one, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jew law. I was zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as the righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else counted it all garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection of which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive this heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. The word of the Lord. Is this good? Good morning. Hello, my name is Guma. There's my sister over there who just went, Raya. I'll be reading John 12, 1 through 8 in New Living Translation. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he raised from the dead. A dinner was planned in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Good morning, people of God. How are you? I'm going to be reading Jeremiah 22, 1, 2, 3 out of the New King James Version. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and there speak this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David and you your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plunder out of the hands of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger and the fatherless or the widows, nor shed innocent blood in this place. This is the word of the Lord. Father, thank you for your word read because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, Father, thank you that faith has come for this season that we find ourselves in. I pray now that you'll let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Pray that you'll breathe on the word today because Father, in days like this, we don't need another dead lever. We need a living word. Amen. So breathe on the word. And even as you breathe in our praise and worship at the communion table with words of knowledge and also with testimony, I pray that you'll breathe on us once again as we minister to your people from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people say it. Amen. Amen. This year, we had a focus on the Holy Spirit, focus on the Holy Spirit, his person, his power, his presence, and his provision. We spent the month of January looking at the fact that the Spirit of God, Ra, Elohim, moves in the midst of chaos. We then begin to move into the fact that it is the Spirit of God that is the Spirit of creativity, because it's through the Spirit of God, Ra, Elohim, that everything was created. He's the only one ex nihilo that can make everything from nothing. We then last week looked at the fact for the last few weeks that he's not only the uh, spirit of creativity, but he's also the cleansing spirit. And last week we looked at Psalm 51 where the first time the word Holy Spirit is used in the Bible. The first time the word Holy Spirit is used in the Bible is Ruach HaKadosh. In the Greek, it would be Numa Hagion, Holy Spirit. Now, why is that important? Because every one of these names of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit, gets a different nuance about him. And the more you and I drill down in these different names of the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the Lord God will understand more of his person. Over this month, I'd like to prepare us by talking about the anointing spirit. And I'd like to start with some preliminary statements because some of you who have been in our kingdom a while have heard the word anointing used. We sell anointing oil in our bookstore because people come and ask for it. The word anointing then is not really a sign of office or a significance in status or privilege. The word anointing just simply means, and it gives a sense of being empowered to do a task or given a responsibility, anointing. In the Bible, it talks about the anointed one, Christos, Christ, Messiah. And this was somebody that was chosen and commissioned by God to do a job for God, a job that God wanted to be done in, they were enabled by God's power, God's spirit to get on with it and to get it done, the anointing. There are three phases of the anointing that are spoken of in the Hebrew scriptures. The first one is the anointing that came upon historical kings. And kings of Israel were anointed to do a particular task and job, and that's what we want to look 
at today because you and I have been called to be kings and priests in the earth. And it's important that we understand our rulership responsibility in the earth. So there was anointing that came upon kings. In fact, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed by God. Second of all, there is a prediction that anointed one is coming. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures anticipate the coming of a servant king that was called the anointed one. But not only are there servant kings, rulers that were anointed and empowered by God to get on with it and get a task done, but then there were the servant kings anointed. Whenever you say that you're a Christian, you're saying I'm an anointed one. And if you call yourself an anointed one, you need to be getting on with it. And getting the task done. And so there's not only kings that were anointed, there's not only the anointed one, servant king, but there are also the servant kings anointed, which are you and I. And so it's important for us to understand this word is used. Now, second point I want to make in preliminary statements is that when we look at the anointing, it's important that you understand that every time we read the Bible, we read it and we put on certain lens that we read the Bible through. Everybody does. Some people read the Bible through a Christological lens. They see Christ from Genesis chapter 3, 15, all the way to the end of the book. They read it through a Christological lens. Some people read it through a salvific lens or a soteriology lens. They see salvation from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of the book. Some people read the Bible, uh, if you will, with a miracle lens. All they see is miracles. That's all they want to talk about is miracles in the Bible. Some people read it from a prosperity lens. And that's where you sometimes hear people talk about prosperity teachers. They see prosperity everywhere from the original man, a man, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth all the way to the new Jerusalem. Some people read it from a Hebraic lens. All they want to do is study Hebraic culture and deeds and, and, and feasts, and they read it from a Hebraic lens. Some people read the Bible through a covenantal lens. They read it in the covenant or in, in, in the lens of covenant. Some people read it from a, uh, from a dispensational lens, and that is that they say God operated in a certain amount of time and in a certain way in a certain period of time. That's called dispensational lens. And so everything uh, that you talk about, they say, now what dispensation was that? Some people read it from a sacramental lens, and that is that they read it always about the feast, always about the feast, and see nuances and types and shadows about the feast, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. Some people read it from a doctrinal lens, systematic theology, and they see the theology that's being spoken of uh, in that particular text. Some people read it from an eschatological lens. That's the doctrine of last days. These would be called faith or last in, in time preachers. And everything is always that the Antichrist is coming and he's going to take over and you're going to have a mark on your head, the 666. He's going to take you down to hell when he goes down with you. And that's an eschatological lens. Some people read the Bible from a personal lens, and I don't care if it's a communal text, they see it as personal. And then there's some people like myself that read the Bible from a communal text because I believe that God speaks to the community from the text. We read the Bible through lens. Some people read the Bible through a paternal lens. They see the Father's hand all the way through the scriptures. And if you will, at some point in time, go back and read John chapter 14 that we quote at funerals uh, often. And notice how many times the word father is used. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me in my father's house. And then just circle the word fathers all the way through that. Some people read it from a paternal lens. But then some people, like we are doing this year, are reading the Bible through a pneumatology pneumatological lens. A pneuma is spirit. And then it's we're studying the spirit. Some people read the Bible through a worship lens. Everything they see is worship. That's all they want to talk about. That lens is on their face. Some people read it through a faith, a, a feast lens. And that's all they want to see is the feast of God. What feast was going on? Do you know that some people read the Bible through an ecclesiastical lens? And that is all they want to do is see the community of God in the Hebrew scriptures and in the church and the community of God in the new covenant. Some people read it from a prophetic lens. All they see is prophecy, being prophesied all the way through it. Some people read the Bible from a humanitarian lens. All they want to do is see how God is interacting with humanity. And then some people, and this is popular and is also lucrative right now, that means you can make a lot of money from it, the grace lens. And the grace lens, some people, they see grace all the way through the Bible. Some people read it from a faith lens. I read the Bible that way in addition 
to reading about the Spirit because the Spirit and, and the Word are one. And friends from a faith land, that's why over the 40 years history of our church, every summer from June until August, I would teach on faith in the summertime at our church in our Bible study on Wednesday night when we were in person. Do you know that some people read the Bible from a judgment lens? That God's mad at you because of your sin. And he gonna get you. Squash you like a bug. Tell you about yourself. And then drag you into a burning hell that will burn with a fire and then cast you into the lake of fire. And you're gonna be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some people read the Bible like that. Some people read the Bible from a black lens. Everything in the Bible is black. Black folk everywhere. And they read it from that lens. And we chuckle at that, but my son asked me very young in age, my oldest son, about what did these people look like in the Bible? And what we did is when we read through the Bible that year, all we did was just break out a map every time a country was mentioned. And my son made the observation that black folks live there. I said, man, we all through the book. So some people read it through a black lens. Some people read the Bible from a missions lens, that the Bible's all about God saving lost people. And missiologists are people that go on the mission for God to see the lost saved. Some people read the Bible from a justice lens. That's how I was brought up at Union Grove Baptist Church. My salvific journey did not start in Romans 10, 9 or Acts 2, 38. My salvific journey started in the book of Exodus. And I was taught God not only wants to save you from, save you from sin, he also wants to save you from Pharaoh and oppression. Yes. 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 So some people read it from a justice lens. Some people read the Bible from a love lens. The love lens. Love, 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 crazy love. Some people lead the Bible from a mercy in, that they always want to see the mercy of God. And now very popular and lucrative as well. Some people read the Bible from a kingdom lens. Kingdom lens. Over the 40 years, I can mention these because I've taught through all of these lenses as we've been in the church because I'm an apostle. Apostles want to give you the whole counsel of God. We want to tell you the whole story, not just a little bit. So for those of you who've stayed on the journey with us for 40 years, then you've seen us teach through these various lenses. But now I would like to talk about this, this year, focusing in on the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit deal with justice in our community? The Holy Spirit and justice. Now, in the Hebrew scriptures, prophets, we're in our notes now, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed. The anointing is a recognition and an impartation of the power by the Spirit of God. Well, Elohim, it's an anointing, it's a recognition and an impartation of power by the Spirit of God. Now, uh, Wright, Christopher Wright in his book, Knowing the Holy Spirit Through the Old Testament, makes this observation that the work of the Holy Spirit in the, scripts, in the Hebrew Scriptures was empowering leaders for three things. First of all, it's empowering leaders uh, in giving the law and also in enabling people to stand for justice. That's what the anointing was for. It empowered leaders, it gave them law, and it also enabled God's people to stand for justice. Kings of Israel was opposed to embody all three of these. Kings of Israel, rulers, were expected to be strong leaders in order to defend God's people like the judges in, in the battle necessary, and, and in battle if necessary. Kings were expected to know and to serve the law and to give wise decisions when cases were brought before them. And all kings were ideally expected to provide justice for the weak and the poor, especially those who lacked natural protection of a strong family. This would be like widows and orphans who had no protection and care for them, such as widows and orphans. Leaders, leaders. Now, as we look this morning, I want you to understand that kings were anointed. The first point is just scriptures that just kind of build a case for the anointing of king. Before there was ever a king in Israel, ever a ruler, God prophesied to his prophet Moses in Deuteronomy 17, 18. He says, now when a king takes the throne of, of the kingdom, it says he shall write for himself a scroll and a copy of the law. It says taken from 
the Levite priest. The Levite was supposed to give him a scroll. He was supposed to write his own. It was to be with him, and he was to read it all the days of his life so that he might learn to revere the Lord for uh, his God and follow carefully the words of the law and the, and, and the decrees that were there. Neither consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, or he could not turn from the law to the right or to the left. Deuteronomy 17 said, before there was a king, and I know we live in a democracy, not a mono, not, not a, not, we are not monotheistic. We are monotheistic, but we don't live in a theocracy. But some of these principles are transferable, especially if you say we are a Christian nation. And it says here, if you are a leader, you are supposed to take and write a copy of the law. When I was in India with my friend Joshua Emanuel, every year they bring a big old book out, and the members of their church start at Genesis 1, and they take turns coming in and writing from the Bible into that book a handwritten copy of the Bible over the course of the year. And friends, the king was to write the law, and not only write it, but then they were supposed to read it, and then they were also supposed to do it. That's what kings were supposed to do. They were supposed to revere God before there was a king. That's what the prophet prophesied. Then uh, Psalm 72 comes in. He says, now endow thou the king. This is called the Psalm of Solomon. This is a psalm that was pointed to Solomon, and it says, endow the king with your justice, O Lord. It says, thy royal son, with your righteousness. Now, there's two words I'm going to deal with over this next month. Righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice. Look at your neighbor and tell him for me, and I'm saying it for the, for the virtual audience, tell him pastor does not preach on social justice. You didn't say that loud enough. I said, say it. I don't put adjectives in front of words that there are no adjectives in front of in the Bible. The Bible talks about justice. Why is that important? Because social justice is very wide. I'm talking about justice from the Bible. Are you hearing me? So don't go out and say, oh, pastors, on that social justice again, you're a liar. I never had preached on social justice from this pulpit. I had preached on justice. There are two words that are, we find in the Hebrew scriptures. Righteousness, and righteousness was worked for in the Hebrew scriptures. Righteousness because of grace is given to us in the Christian scriptures. Righteousness is given to us in the Christian scriptures. We have the gift of grace and righteousness by grace. Righteousness is a gift from God in our covenant. However, you have to do justice because faith without works is dead. You are given righteousness. That's the lamb. But you are to do justice. That's the lion. And the lion and the lamb walk together. So he said, when you sit on the throne, it says, endow your king with justice, O God. Psalm 72. It says, O the royal son of your righteousness. It says, may he judge your people in righteousness and uh, your uh, affected ones or afflicted ones with justice. It says, may he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. For he will deliver the needy out who cry out. It says, and the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. Those are random scriptures that are in your notes from Psalm 72, verses 1, 2, 4, and 12 through 13. The king that sits upon the throne it would be the throne of God's justice, and he was to do righteousness and justice. Look with me now in Proverbs. Proverbs gives some, some, some guidelines for kings. Guidelines, and this is good guidelines for rulers too. He says here, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, uh, neat, uh, nor rulers uh, uh, crave uh, beer. He says, lest they drink to forget uh, what has been uh, decreed and deprive all the oppressed 
of their, uh, of their righteousness. Then it says in verse number eight and nine, it says, speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. It says, for, uh, for, for the rights of all who are destitute. It says, speak up, judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Now listen, Proverbs chapter 31, that we uh, always look for that virtuous woman passage. Before that, it speaks to the king. And it tells him, man, listen, just do what's right. Decree justice. And then he goes on and he says, now listen, don't be getting drunk because drunkenness will impair your judgment. The verses that I skip between six and seven, it says, give strong drink to actually dead people that are dying. That was their anesthesia for death. See, before you, you ought to try living before you embalm yourself. And he knew if somebody was intoxicated and giving judgment, judgment would be impaired. But then he says, you need to cry out as a judge and as a king for those who need their rights defended. Listen, Psalm 22, I mean, Jeremiah 22, verses 2 and 3. I would like to read that. It was read in our hearing, in our Somatic text. And so was uh, John chapter 12 was read uh, uh, there where Jesus was anointed. Again, anointed again, this time by a human being. One time he's anointed by his father. This time he's anointed by this. But now Jeremiah says, hear the word of the Lord. 22, he says to you, the king of Judah, you will sit on David's throne. Now he says, now do what's just and right. Notice those two statements. Live right and be right towards God. That's righteousness. Righteousness is being right towards God. And justice is doing right towards people. There needs to be justice and righteousness. Be right towards God and fair towards people. It says, rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do not, do no wrong and violence to the foreigner, to the fatherless, the widow, the, the quartet of the vulnerable, and do not shed innocent blood um, in their place. Now, the quartet of the vulnerable is that there are some things that just kind of walk along together. Uh, the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the oppressed. The widow, the orphan, the poor, and the oppressed, they walk along together. But then sometimes the quartet of the vulnerable is the widow, the orphan, the stranger, or the international, and the oppressed. We are to do right by them. Now, 1 Kings, uh, uh, first Ki uh, first Kings chapter 3, verse 28, you'll get through this in a minute. It says, when all of Israel heard the verdict of the king Solomon had given, it says, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Here's what's happening in this text. Two women have newborns. They're staying in the same location. During the course of the night, one of the newborns dies. One mother with her newborn is fast asleep. Newborn still living. The mother with the dead newborn slips over takes the living newborn and puts her dead child next to the mother. When the women wake up, one woman has a baby that's not hers alive, but the woman wakes up and she looks at that baby and she knows that's not her baby. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you know your baby. <laughs> a dispute breaks out and the dispute gets so vocal and volatile that it gets all the way before the king. And they ask the king to make a judgment. The king looks at them and they're fussing back and forth. And he says, well, what do you say? And they say, and the one lady says, well, we can't agree on whose baby it is. And she's holding an alive baby. She says, so here, take this alive baby and split it in half. Give half to her and half to me. That will settle the dispute. The lady standing there with the dead baby, knowing that that's her alive baby over there, said, oh, no, don't cut the baby in half. If that's going to be your judgment, just let her have the baby. And Solomon said, that's the mother right there <laughs> who would rather give up her living child than see her living child dead. Solomon had the wisdom of God. And anyone that's in public position cannot just act on natural wisdom. Because some dilemmas are going to come before public officials that they will need the wisdom of God and the proper judgment of God. That's why they were anointed to do justice. 
Finally, 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse number 9, it says, Praise be to the Lord your God who has, uh, has delighted in you and has placed you on the throne. He's saying this is Solomon because the Lord's eternal love for Israel. He has made you, Solomon King, to maintain, notice these two words again, justice, it's in your notes, and righteousness. He's made you king to maintain justice, fair, fairness towards people, and righteousness, and that is right with me. I made the statement at the end of point number one, kings in Israel were anointed with oil. Speaking of a commissioning and empowering by Yahweh, the Lord, to give uh, them through the Spirit for the task that was laid before them. That's what the anointing is for. It is an empowerment by God to give you ability to do the task that's set before you. Let's look at three kings. We're going to look at the first three kings that rule in Israel or that ruled in Israel eventually. First king was called Saul. And Saul was anointed by God. Listen, Samuel was told, then Samuel took the flask of oil and he poured it on Saul. Head, and it said, and he kissed him and says, has not the Lord anointed you as leader over his inheritance? And it says, and the spirit of the Lord, this is called Ruach Yahweh, the spirit of the Lord. This is a covenantal name of God came powerfully upon him and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into another man. Powerful scripture. And when he and his servants arrived at Gibeah, listen, a possession of the prophets, he met him in the spirit of God. Ra Elohim, the creative spirit, came upon him powerfully, and he joined and prophesied with him. He's a king, and he starts prophesying. Listen, the anointing can be symbolic, it can be experiential, or it can be tangible. And even today, the anointing can be symbolic, it can be experiential, and it can be tangible. I've laid hands and anointed people, thousands of people across the world. And one of the things that I've discovered is that there are some people, you anoint them, it's just, it's just okay, thank you for the oil. It's just, uh, it's just symbolic. There are other people that shake and quake, and some people even fall under the power of God. It can be experiential. They can actually draw what's in this vessel to themselves, and there can be an impartation. And then sometimes it's just tangible, manifested by tears, but then also an activation to go do what God said to do. Listen, Saul was anointed and failed. The anointing is not a guarantee of your success. The anointing is not a guarantee of your success. Because if you and I do not cooperate with the empowerment of God, we can be like just like any other man and any other woman. But it does empower us to cooperate with it. Now, when Saul has died because of his disobedience, Ishbosheth is appointed. Saul was anointed. Ishbosheth, the second king of Israel, uh, is appointed. Ishbosheth, that's the son of Saul, and he is made king by a man named Abner. I'll read a few of these verses here in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and he brought him to Mahaniam, and he says, and he made him king uh, over Gilead, and over Asherite, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, over Benjamin, and over Israel. And Ishbosheth, the son, uh, his son, uh, was 40 when he began to reign, and he reigned, notice this, two years. And the house of Judah followed David, and, and at that time, and David was the king at Hebron, over the house of Judah, and there he reigned seven and a half years. Now watch this. This is important because this man Ishbosheth, second king of Israel. This is during the time of the divided kingdom. Now some people call David the second king of Israel. That's not really true. In fact, when we were in Israel, our guide talked about who was the second king of Israel, and almost everybody on the bus said David. And he said no. And everybody started looking around and said, what? Because there was a time of the divided king. Saul died, and Abner, Saul's bodyguard, the captain of his host, took and appointed Ishbosheth as king over certain tribes. He was appointed. There are some people that are anointed, and there are some people that are appointed. 
That happens in the church frequently. Where sometimes there's a minister who is anointed by God. And the anointing is upon someone else. But because this one over here has kinship relationship. They're appointed and everything fizzles out. There's a difference between being anointed. Okay, y'all ain't gonna help me. That's all right. <laughs> and appointed. You experience it in the marketplace because some of you are graced and anointed to do work in a certain department. Somebody doesn't like you. They move it and then they put a relational promotion in there. Somebody else. They're not anointed to do that work. And when they get in there, then they calling you all the time to say, now, how do you do this? And how you do that? And you say, you got the job now. <laughs> At least that's what a good Christian would say. <laughs> but they were appointed. But they were not empowered and anointed by God. You could be anointed for the marketplace. We looked at that a few weeks ago. And friends, that becomes important. And he fizzled out. And Ishbosheth was appointed and lasted two years. And that's why a lot of ministers burn out because they just think ministry would be something nice to do. And they weren't anointed by God to do that. They were just appointed by somebody that told them, you look like you make a good minister. And then they burn out and fizzle out. Look at my statements here. Okay, the anointing means, uh, the word anoint means you can pour, you can dab, you can smear, or you can rub. Anointing. You can pour. When I ordain ministers, I put oil in my hand and pour it on their head. You can dab, you can smear, and then you can rub. Let me tell you, not all oil poured on rubs in. Some people like that old Brill Cream commercial. I don't know if that stuff is still even around. A little dab. Oh, some of y'all were around in that day. Some of you young people, y'all missed all that. Be glad, okay? A little dab would do you was a commercial jingle. And they just say, just need a little bit. And that's all some people wanted the Holy Ghost, just a little bit. But not all oil poured on gets smeared and rubbed in. And friends, that's what happens sometimes when you have appointments rather than anointing. See, when you have the anointing, there's a difference between lightning and the light. Light is enduring. Lightning is a flash. And there's a lot of people in ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they call themselves prophets, priests, and kings, and they just are lightning, but they're not light. Because people need something that's enduring. There's a difference between a spark and fire. Because fire perpetually burns. It doesn't burn out, it just keeps on burning. And friends, there's a difference between a dab and a rub. See, the anointing does not guarantee your success of a leader or your faithfulness or your longevity. You need to make sure that what God has appointed, he's anointed you to do, he's anointed you for that task. You see, Ishbosheth and Saul, both, one was anointed, one was appointed, both of them failed. One burned out, one failed. Listen, what about David? David becomes a measure for kings in the future and rulers. And it takes the anointing to forget, first of all, and leave some things behind. It takes the anointing to leave behind and get over grief. Samuel was, a, was grieving over Saul. And in 1 Kings chapter 16, it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn over Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? During that time of the divided kingdom, Saul dies, Ishbosheth is appointed, Samuel still grieving over Saul. He said, Fill your horn with some oil and be on your way. He says, for I am sending you to, uh, uh, to, to Jesse of Bethlehem's house, and I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Friends, sometime for you to move into what God wants you to move into, you have to have the anointing to leave behind some stuff. And sometimes it takes the power of God to bust you out of one space and to bring you to another space. And friends, you can never arrive where God wants to take you by holding on to where you were. You got to forget things that are behind. It was read this morning. And reach forward to those things that are for. And press towards the mark, towards the prize of the high calling of God 
in Christ Jesus. David was anointed king. He forgot what was behind. It says, and then the Lord said, rise up and anoint him. It says, so Saul, uh, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. This is in Jesse's house, in the presence of his brethren on that day. And the spirit of the Lord, Ra Yahweh, the covenant God, powerfully came upon David. Listen, when one is anointed, you can do signs and wonders and miracles and exploits for the Lord. Listen, here it says, and God spoke to David. And he said, this is a man after my own heart. This is a man after my own heart. This is a man after my own heart. What does this idiom mean? He is a man after his own heart. In other words, he said, listen, I know that this is a man after my heart. That, that idiom, uh, 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 Wright says, uh, 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 Christopher Wright says, means that someone who is particularly fond of is what we would think of. He says, or who shares the kings or is a favorite person. But really the idiom does not mean any of that, says right. That idiom means one who will be thinking like me, weighing in like me, deciding like me, and planning like me. That's what one after one's heart means. See, the heart was a place, was a seat of thinking in the Hebrew mind. Weighing in or leaning in, deciding, and also planning. David was called a man after all God's own heart. I love David. David was a man of war. He's a man after God's heart. He thought like God. He wanted to do like God. And even when he made a mistake, we heard, we heard it last week in Psalm 51. He doesn't call upon the spirit of the Lord that came upon him. He calls upon the rock, Hakadesh, the Holy Spirit. Because when you're in a mess, you need the Holy Spirit to come clean you up. Don't run from the Holy Spirit. Run to him when you're in a mess. First time the word Holy Spirit is used in our Bible, Psalm 51. It's a man after God's own heart. Why do I like David? The anointing should bring you into alignment with God's will, his plan, and his mind. That's what the anointing does. Part of what I do in the morning time is some of you have received texts from me where I finish my morning time prayer sometime, and I will text you four or five o'clock in the morning and say, I just finished praying for you. Why? Because I want God's will, God's plan, God's, God's provision to be upon God's people. And friends, when I'm up praying for folks, I'm not praying my will. I'm saying, thy will be done. Hallelujah. And friends, that's what the anointing will do. I love David because David was anointed as a king to do righteousness and justice and mar for marginalized and the broken. Here's what I love about David. David solved community problems. Most of y'all know the story of David and Goliath. You know what Goliath represents to me, Lois? He represents a big community problem out there in the middle of the, of the community. He's out there cursing God and God's people. And all the soldiers are standing on the sideline and nobody's saying nothing. David's father, by the providence of God, goes, take your brother some lunch out there on the battlefield. And David takes his brother some lunch, and guess what happens? When he comes out there, he sees this big dude down there cursing God and cursing the armies of God. David said, well, what is this? He said, y'all standing here scared? He said, is there not a cause? And they say, you see how big this guy is? He said, well, what would a guy get if he goes down there to him? He said, well, you get the, uh, the, the king's daughter. You'll become part of the king's family. Get to marry her. He said, you'll get some new clothes. And listen to this. You won't have to pay any more taxes. I believe David said, no more taxes. <laughs> That's what I imagine in my prophetic imagination. <laughs> and when he heard that he gets those benefits, David says, I'm going down. Saul then uh -huh. says, here, take this armor, because that's a big dude. You're going to need it. David said, no, nah, I don't need that. Because when you're anointed by God, God takes the fishes and loaves and uses you. And David said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I know how to kill stuff. He said, I got a sling and I got some stones. He said, when a bear came up against my sheep, I killed the bear with this. And he said, and snatched the sheep out of his mouth. He said, when a lion came against me, he said, I killed the lion with this. And he said, and who is this uncircumcised giant? I like David. Prophet Leon Forte says, the next few verses tell us the rest of the story. Because Prophet Leon Forte says, that's how you know David was black also. <laughs> because... Prophet Leon Forte, and I quote, says, 
The next part of the text says, and he took five suits, smoke, and he took out one, and he hit the giant in his head, and it said, and it smote him, and he fell to the ground and died. That's what the verse says. The very next verse said, then David ran to him, took out his sword, and killed him. There's only one ethnic group that talk about killing somebody dead. And I quote the prophet, Pastor Eddie. He said, that's how you know he was black. Because he killed him dead. Can I say this as I close, Robert, you can come. Listen to me. There is some stuff that needs to be halted in our community. There are some big Goliaths out there that we're facing. But we are not alone because we are the anointed of God. We're anointed by God to solve community problems. Righteousness and grace is a gift from God. We receive grace and the gift of righteousness. But hear me well. You also need to understand, but we are called to do justice. Do what's right towards people. Solve community problems. Saul was anointed, failed. Ishbosheth. If you ever had problems with that name, just remember Ishmael. Ishbosheth was a descendant of Ishmael. Okay, does that help you with pronunciation? Sometimes I have to do word association with these names in Hebrew. Ishbosheth was appointed and flamed and burned out in two years. But David stayed seven and a half years down in Judah with his family. And then eventually he rose up in the absence of Saul and Ishbosheth, and all of Israel came and made him king. You have an anointing from the Spirit of God. You are empowered to solve community problems. And we together corporately are empowered to solve community problems. Let's not squander the anointing. Let's not just walk around talking about I'm anointed. <laughs> Let's take the empowerment God has given unto us and change our communities because prophets, priests, and kings were empowered by God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come before you and I thank you today, Father, for Christians, anointed ones. I thank you that you have empowered us and anointed us to, uh, Father, accomplish some things in our community. Father, before we leave planet Earth, Father, help us to let the community know that some anointed ones were in the community. I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that the anointing that is upon us shall come and then will move through us to solve community issues not just in sanctuary space, but every place. Not just in sanctuary space, but every place. Let us move out and solve community problems. Let us do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. I believe you for this, and I thank you for it, and give you glory for it now, in the name of Jesus. Now by faith, I believe, Father, what you have done, I believe what you're doing. Now I believe you for those that are here. The qualifier for the Holy Spirit and the anointing to come upon you is to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that if you're here and you have not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you know you need a change in your life, Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. If you're here in person or if you're viewing us by virtual broadcast there in your living room, your townhouse, your home, uh, your, uh, your apartment, I want you to know that right where you are right now, you can step out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm going to lead you in a prayer for those of you that are in this sanctuary. You can pray this prayer with me and this prayer will be an affirmation of your faith. If you are outside of our kingdom or if you know I just need to get my life right today, Pray this prayer with me and your life will be adjusted 
and not only adjust it, but transform right now. With that in mind, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Pray this after me, God in heaven. Today I come to you. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is Lord. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. By his stripes, I am healed. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Rule my life. Rule my spirit, my soul, my body, my family life, my social life, my economic life. I renounce the past. Everything Satan has done in my life, I am finished with it. Now, Jesus, you are my Lord, my Savior, my baptizer with the Holy Spirit, my closest friend. From this moment forward, I will live for you. Live big in me, Jesus. My life will never be the same. Amen. Now listen, if you're in here, maintain, have your head bowed, your eye closed, and you say, listen, I prayed that prayer for the first time. Raise your hand. If you prayed that prayer, you know you had a changed life. I see your hand back here. Anybody else? You prayed that. Amen. I see these hands here. You prayed that prayer. You know that your life has been changed. Good. I saw a hand over here. You saw that? Yeah, yeah. You prayed that prayer. One, two, three, four over there. One, two, three. Okay, good. And another one right there. Good. I see those hands. Your lives were changed this morning. Listen to me now. For those that prayed that prayer, about eight of you in here, there's a, there's a screen coming on. If you have a cell phone, you can take it out now because you're going to be able to use it now. There's going to be a QR code that's going to come on that screen, and it said, I gave my life to Christ today. And when that screen comes up, if you'll just take a picture of that, it'll take you to our website, and on our website, we'll ask you for your name, we'll ask you for your email, and it will be an opportunity for you. Uh, to, for us to contact you. We have a personal worker, and that personal worker will contact you, and they will pray with you. They'll pray with you that you'll come on into the faith right here. How will they pray with you? They'll help you to understand that now you need to be water baptized, baptized with the Holy Spirit, and connect with our church. You can also text 833-308-3088, 833-308-3088. You can text there, and you can text SAVE to 833-308-3088. 3088. If you came with a loved one or with a friend, they will guide you through this process also. And I'll rely on those who brought a friend, a relative, an associate, a neighbor, or a child with you today. And if you brought somebody with you, they'll guide you through this process so that you can connect. And we thank you for that. If you need further prayer, because some people need prayer for maybe a nagging problem, you heard this testimony from Yolanda today, and she talked about what she was, but now what she is. That's what Jesus can do. And I want you to know if you need further prayer, you can use this QR code. And this QR code will take you to our website. We have a prayer life team. And that prayer life team will pray with you and will ask you for your name, your email, and what do you want us to pray for? Some people want us to pray with them, not just for them. And use this QR code, it'll take you to the uh, website. You can also text PRAY to 833-308-3088, and that'll take you to our website, and our prayer life team will be there to pray with you, and your life will be changed. And church, you ought to shout that eight people had their lives changed in this sanctuary this day in Jesus' name. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord God. With that being said, Father, come and seal the word, the ministry, the worship that we've done. Help us to understand that we're the anointed of God. And then live, move, and have your being in us. And then move through us so that we can solve large community problems as rulers and as kings and priests. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Let's prepare. Let me prepare the house for our offering this morning. Let me give you instructions, and then we're going to worship the Lord as we take just a moment to give before we leave. It's offering time in the house of the Lord. Amen. You can give this morning virtually on your cash app. You can give the Rama gift. You can go there. You can give a one-time gift. Uh, there on your cash app. You can also give by mailing in your gifts. Mailing in your gifts to 2100 Agler Road, 43224. We also have a push pay that you can give on. And if you have your push pay, and if you've downloaded our, our mobile device, you can give right there.
for those of you who may have brought in your gifts physically in the hallway, when you leave underneath the mirrors, there's a box that says offerings. Just drop your offering there if you brought it in physically. I am leading offering, so I just brought mine in with me. You could also text to give. You can text Rama to 833-256-8555, 833-256-8555. Text Rama there. It'll get your information and you could give recurring gifts or you can give a one-time gift. And finally, if you're watching us virtually on the website, there's a place right there where you can donate. This is offering time in the house of the Lord and we appreciate your generosity. So with those six ways of giving, choose one and participate. I'm gonna ask everyone in sanctuary to stand for just a moment. And we're gonna make a declaration of faith over your gifts today. And I want to uh, believe God with you that when you give, you're going to get and uh, receive the corresponding return on the seed sown. Amen? Amen. Are y'all ready? Amen. Lift your gifts. Say this after me. Father, Father today, I declare, today I declare the earth, the earth is yours, the, earth is the yours. fullness thereof, the, fullness thereof. the, world, the world, all they that dwell therein. Dwell your word there. says, your word when I give, when I give shall be given unto me. Good, good measure, measure. pressed down, down, shaken together, shaken together and running over shall men pour into my bosom. I'm blessed with wholeness, benefit, prosperity, favor, increase, overflow, more than enough, too much. Divine favor in Jesus' name. And everyone say it, amen. Y'all ready? Let's celebrate the Lord as we give. Give it thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he oh, is good. Oh, give him thanks. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Yes, he is good. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your benevolence in Jesus' name. 
And thank you for being so good to us this morning. I pray now that as you've given, that God will bless you with wholeness, benefit, prosperity, and favor, increase, overflow, more than enough, and too much divine favor in Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Anybody here for the first time this morning, raise your hand. Anybody here for the first time? Okay, I see two hands way in the back. Those that are in the back, welcome them to Rayma Christian Center. There are two people in the back. Welcome them. Welcome them. That's right. Tell them that you're welcome. Welcome, welcome. Great. Welcome. Now, listen, there's a QR code on the screen. If you use your QR reader there, it'll take you to our website, and it'll help you to uh, understand who we are, Rayma Christian Center. It'll take you right there. We'll ask you for your name, your email. Give me an opportunity to drop a note to you to say welcome to Rayma Christian Center. You could also text VISIT to 833-308-3088, 833-308-3088, okay? And uh, our deacons contact people who fill out that little form there with their name and their email, beside my letter, and they'll let you know how we reach the lost, how we train for service, and how we change our world. Welcome to Rayma Christian Center. Rayma Christian Center is like no other place on earth. Come on back and see us again. Your life will never be the same. Amen. A couple announcements for this week. Let me remind everyone that our bookstore is going to be open uh, after service. And uh, you could go in there and visit. They have a lot of specials that are going on there. We're doing what we call spring cleaning. So a lot of stuff been marked down to $5, okay? And so you can go in and uh, pick up your book needs and your educational needs and resource for discipleship. Remember also on Tuesday night, we're doing a Bible study through the book of Psalm, 6.30 to 7.30, 6.30 and that one uh, is listed on our website at ramafamily.com. so remember that. We also have a prayer time uh, on Wednesday night from 6.30 until 7, fire on the line on Wednesday night. That's actually a prayer call where we have all of the saints of God gathering for a half an hour from 6.30 to 7 on Wednesday night, prayer call tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., we will have our first Monday prayer from 6 to 7, 6 to 7, first Monday prayer. And so that's AM, and that's a prayer call. That number is listed also on our website. And then women, remember that you have a call of encouragement every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, I believe it is. On oh, Thursday, is it at 8? Okay, 8 o'clock on Thursday, call of encouragement. Get on the line, all the sisters, and there's a call of encouragement. And then we have lots of small groups going on in terms of Bible study, men's groups, and take advantage of those for your discipleships. And then there are announcements always on the websites on up and coming events. I want you to have a great rest of the day and go out there and change our world. Amen. Amen. Continue to pray. Pastor Eddie Poindexter pray for his family. Arrangements are being made, but he lost his uh, mother at the end of this week and uh, last week. And so pray for the Poindexter family as they prepare for that service. Thank you all for helping us with the Hague family. We saw about 50 young people give their life to Christ at that service uh, with the Burton, Hague, and Mitchell family. Amen. And God did something great. God did something great with that family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So continue to pray for that family. Continue to pray for the Cecily family in Jesus' name and continue to pray one for another. I'm gonna dismiss you and let you go. And then just follow the instructions of the ushers. The uh, team will be leading us uh, as you are departing. And then take some time and greet one another and have a great rest of the week. Let me pray for you and bless you as you go. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord make the light of his face shine upon you and grant you peace. I want you to go in peace and may the peace of God go with you. In Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this broadcast this week. And we have given you some practical steps that you can live out this week in the marketplace, in ministry space, as well as in public space. Remember this also, if you like this broadcast, please give us a thumbs up, share on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Remember this also, contact your friends, your relatives, your associates, neighbors, and kids, and let them know that this has been a meaningful word to you and it will be a meaningful word to them. Until we see you next week, remember this, Raymond Christian Center is like no other place on the earth.